Okay. Okay, well, and I it just said recording in progress, so I probably do not need to remind people that, but just uh, to let everyone know, this um, uh, meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Um, to start, uh, I believe we pretty much all know each other. Is there, uh, are there any introductions that are required? It looks like I think we're good. Um, so, uh, let's move on to additions or deletions to the agenda. Is there anything that anyone would like to add or suggest that we remove from the agenda? Um, we are going to make a little revision on the bylaws and charter discussion. Um, I'm going to ask Frank, I didn't tell you this, Frank, but I'm going to ask you once again to give us the time frame uh, for the bylaws and charter uh, determinations. And um, the bylaws committee did not have the opportunity to meet in April. The next meeting is scheduled for May 10th. And so um, when we get to that point, um, we will not have anything to talk about as far as bylaws and charter. Um, if we do have time and people are agreeable to this, I think it might be an opportunity for us to talk a little bit about mission um, and what we see as the board's mission. Um, so we may make that change time dependent once we reach that point in the agenda. Um, okay, as far as the minutes are concerned, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from April? Sheila, thank you very much. A second, Stu, excellent. Um, are there any changes that anyone would like to make to the minutes? Okay, so can I have a vote, a show of hands for all those who approve? Aye. Excellent. The minutes, the motion to approve the minutes is approved. Um, privilege of the floor. Is there anyone who has anything that they would like to bring up? No, we're good. Okay, great. Um, announcements. I don't have any announcements. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to offer at this time? No, sounds good. Okay, great. Um, moving right along to the chair's report. I do not have a report to offer this time. So we will move Frank to you to the commissioner's report. Um, sure, and I will probably get you some more time as well. Um, uh, one thing to let you guys know is that um, OMH was here last week uh, for our recertification, or was it this week? No, last week. Last week for our recertification, today's Monday, and that would have been tough, um, for our, our licensure recertification visit. Um, uh, things went fairly, fairly well. I think they had a lot of positive, well, there was one gentleman here, he had a lot of positive things to say to the staff that he was working with. Um, he's not done, uh, and apparently he scheduled us kind of around his vacation. So um, he left without completing an exit interview um, he's going to be out of the office for a week or so, um, and then he's got a, a little bit more to do with the pros program, um, and then we'll be having an exit interview. But um, I, I think generally speaking, it went well, and um, we're looking forward to his findings. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, right? We know that there will be things we'll need to work on, um, and I think staff is already aware of what some of those are from what he's he said to them, and they're already working on it. Um, once we know more about the exit interview, I'll be able to give you a bit more detail about what um, uh, what he came up with. But all in all, um, considering everything that's been going on since the last audit, uh, it seems to have gone uh, gone fairly well. So um, just wanted to let you know that that was happening. Um, the state is catching up on audits because I've been to three exit interviews for other organizations locally in the last couple of weeks. So I think, uh, you know, there was a time where they weren't doing any um, because of COVID. And I think they got the instruction that they needed to get, get back to it. So um, Oasis has been in town doing our Oasis providers as well as OMH. So 
um, uh, it's it's good to see that they're back out. And and from what I've seen from the exit interviews I've been a part of with our partner organizations, um, they're all doing doing fairly well. You know, nobody's perfect, of course, and there's always some findings. But I think generally speaking, our organizations are in a good place. So good news on that front. Um, I can uh, kind of cover two of the agenda items fairly quickly then uh, related to the merger and bylaws. I'll start with the bylaws. Um, uh, Maria, you were asking the timeline. So uh, for the Board of Health and the Community Services Board, um, we would need you to be voting um, to send your amended bylaws to the legislature in your September meeting. Um, and the reason for that is we want them to get into the October um, HHS uh, committee. And I think it has to go to government operations too. I don't know that for certain, but we'd want them to be in the legislature committee meetings in October. So in case there's any adjustments or amendments from those meetings, we could then make those and then come back to their November meetings uh, for approval to go to the full legislature. Um, so that way they could vote uh, no later than December. Um, so that's the timeline. Ideally, we'd be done a little bit sooner, um, but that would be the, the kind of the goal date is for the September meetings for the bylaw updates. Thank you. All right. And then just the, the merger update that's on the agenda, I can give that now just so you know how much time you have for the rest of your agenda. Um, really, we're going to keep that on uh, the agenda each month just as a check in to let you know where we are and answer any questions that you might have with the process. Um, so work is still continuing as you guys are on your bylaws with the chart of accounts, um, trying to bring that together um, for the budgeting process. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in the department uh, as well. Um, I think there's some energy building now that we're, you know, we're kind of getting down to the, you know, how, what are our services going to look like and how might we be able to better, you know, meet the needs of everyone. So we've got uh, a senior leadership group, a small uh, group of them is working on um, our children and youth programs and trying to look at some of the initial licensing issues, as well as create a scope and um, uh, a scope and charter for our next cross-functional team, which will be focusing on service integration for our children and youth programs and how we might best serve, which will include co-location um, in, uh, in both spaces by the different programs and how that might look. So that's exciting um, work going on there. The branding effort is uh, continuing. We received um, a summary document from the consultant about our first, from our first discovery meeting. Um, and the team has reviewed it and given feedback. They're putting the finishing touches on that, um, which means we expect them to begin working on the creatives here in the next week or two. Um, and so hopefully we'll, we'll start to, to see some, uh, some actual options uh, that might be available for us. So some exciting work going on there. And the other cross-functional team uh, that is working is, um, uh, it was uh, founded around trying to help us, uh, meaning the internal employees, uh, learn more about each other. Um, and so there's a lot of different things going on. A network mapping survey was completed and the data is being analyzed on that. Um, they're looking at ways to, um, they're looking at different ways that we might be able to understand what each other does. Um, I have a biweekly um, update newsletter that goes out and now um, each one of those contains a person from each building and a little bit of bio about them and their picture. Um, and so we're going to be doing that uh, so folks get, uh, you know, a feeling for that. We're working on a directory, um, which will be, which will have people's pictures and their names and titles and the programs they work in. Um, so a lot of effort going on there. And then um, we're also going to be doing an offshoot um, from that group uh, for our June 29th. Um, we're having an all staff meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. So is in the way you know. We have a June 29th um, all staff meeting scheduled for we're going to be closing down both departments and bringing everybody together for the full day, uh, kind of like that December 2019 event that we had pre COVID. Um, it'll be kind of a re energizing a re kickoff um, for the staff, um, but we're also going to use it as an opportunity to, to get to know each other and work and learn together. Um, over the course of the day, it'll be an event at the health department. Hopefully the weather will be nice. We'll be outside 
for a large bit of it and, you know, having activities and team building and those kinds of things. So um, a lot of excitement and energy, I think, building around this. And uh, I think in the next few months, we're going to start to see some tangible things occurring um, as well. So um, that's really the, the merger update and where we are. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Sure. Harmony, Deputy Commissioner's Report. Thanks, Maria. So one local thing, and then I'll give you some updates from a, a conference that I attended that might have uh, some interesting information that you might want to look into a little bit further. Uh, I wanted to let you know that our Suicide Prevention Coalition will be having a space on our county website fairly soon. They uh, developed a strategic plan that they're now working on, and that plan will be able uh, for people to find right on our website fairly soon. That's to be coming out. Uh, so I attended the local conference of the Yep, I'm saying it wrong. Local Mental Hygiene Directors Conference, June 20th, or June, I'm already in June, April 20th to the 21st. I hope I get through this report. I'm <laughs> making some mistakes here. Um, and they had a number of speakers come and talk with us, and I thought some of them would be highlights that would be interesting to you. One of them was about uh, what's called the 1115 or the 1115 waiver amendment. And in simple terms, what that is, is uh, an amendment to how Medicaid can be billed and federal Medicaid can be billed in each state. So most states have these waivers and it means that you can just do something differently with the dollars than how they are normally intended to be used. Uh, so New York State started having waivers in 1997 and they didn't include anything about behavioral health until 2016. So it took a little bit of time for that. Uh, the plan that with the waiver that we had before was not re-approved. So they usually go for a number of years and then they get two more years. It's not like I've been so you know like that. They want you to do the entire thing. So that's what happened most recently. They got an extension, but they need to update the entire waiver uh and Mary, can i interrupt you um sure. other people having issues with the sound i am yeah i don't know it, it's going in and out harmony and then there was a lot of static interesting okay um what i'll try is i'll go in i'll leave and come back and see if you're better now you're better now yeah you're better now all i okay I don't know what I did, but that's good. <laughs> so, so these 1115 waivers need to get approved periodically and we're at a point when that's happening again. What's important for you to know about it is that there's a public a comment period. One of them is tomorrow from one to 4 p.m. And then there's another one that will be next week on May 10th. And Cran will send you the link for the one tomorrow. I don't have the link yet for the May 10th. They were going to do it earlier in like April 28th, but they had to cancel it uh, because I think they had a big turnout and uh, they needed to adjust however they were gonna provide this opportunity. Um, the waiver talks about a number of different things, uh, and, but it's really gonna be focusing on health equity uh, focused system uh, redesign. So they're looking at how can we really improve health equity, create health equity reform in our current system of care. They're going to be talking about supportive housing and homeless services, and uh, how can they improve workforce capacity, and how can they improve digital health and telehealth infrastructure across the state. So that's your opportunity to really learn about from a large level how how the state is thinking about improving behavioral health in the next years to come uh, so it, it could be worth your time if you're able to participate in it and you'll get that link um Karen will send it to you i also wanted to let you know that oasis uh, did a presentation for us and they focused on uh housing services which was interesting i thought from them they had um they apparently provide a lot of housing and I didn't realize how much housing they provide. They have 2,700 apartments across the state through Oasis 
And one of the things they're really concerned about is the number of people that get out of um, a, a program, either a detox program or a residential program, and they end up homeless. So one of the piloted projects they tried was to actually pay for a uh, transitional safety uh, uh, transitional safety unit eligibility or these transitional units for people to live in, apartments to live in when they were coming out of jail or if they were coming out of a residential program. And they offered them up to 39 providers that do some housing for them now. And of those 39 providers, only half of them said that they were interested in getting this money to provide um, extra housing to people. And they were very concerned. They're like, why did only half of them apply? It was all free money. Like, why didn't they want to do it? And they found out that the half that didn't do it were really concerned about not having it tied to, to case management support. So they were really looking at how can we improve housing opportunities? Oasis has never traditionally done a lot of housing, uh, but they really see it as a barrier to people getting it. Um, well, like how, do, how are you in recovery if you're in a homeless shelter? And then how are you in recovery if you have housing, but you don't have any of these services wrapped around you? So they really wanted to make sure there was case management and care coordination offered too. So that's some of the strategies that they're looking at to develop in the future. Office of Mental Health gave us a report on their focus on children and family services. And one of the things they said that I think is... Uh, really compelling is that they're anticipating that children and youth will harmony your microphone has gone quiet it's very hard to hear you is this better if i move closer no it's still very no. quiet well maybe we should that's move on better. and that's you know i think i have a loose connection if if I press like that and hold into it, you can hear me, okay? Yeah, perfectly. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, and this is my last point because I know it's painful to have to listen to someone when you can't hear them. Uh, so OMH really was looking at children's services. And one of the things that they really are considering is that we're going to see the ramifications on children's mental health over the next 15 years at least, that this, the lack of access to care and to schools and the numbers of situations that probably really needed uh, some sort of involvement around abuse and, and neglect and things that children were exposed to, we're going to just see this uh, play out over many years in the lives of children. So they're really looking at how can they enhance services for children. They want intensive outpatient programs for children. They're looking at even figuring out how to put those in schools. They want to expand ACT program that we have for adults to children. So far, our county has not qualified for that service for children, but there are two more rounds of funding. So keep your fingers crossed that we can bring ACT services uh, to children and they want to have clinic expansions and increase beds for hospitalization for youth who really are re going to require that level of service. So there's really a strong emphasis on building an infrastructure for youth. Now, how much of that will play out in our local community is yet to be seen, but at least uh, I think the focus is important and going in the right direction. They also talked about uh, school-based mental health programs, and there was a little bit of a pushback, like their Department of Health programs, they're not Office of Mental Health. And they say, you know what, we need everybody at the table and we need to really figure out how we can all work together to meet the needs. We're not going to have enough of these satellite programs and schools to really meet the needs. And there was a really big push, and this is uh, exciting for us in particular, to include Department of Health at the table. We need the Office of Mental Health, OASIS, OPWDD needs to start having communication with um, the Department of Health as well. OPWDD has done an extraordinary amount of work on workforce development and recruitment, things that I think every one of the other departments should look at. And they are going to be offering an innovation grant. It's really about workforce innovation. And that might be something our subcommittee wants to dig into a little bit deeper. Um, they have some ideas about how they're going to be working with BOCES and community colleges and really encourage that people enter the field. Uh, and they have a very uh, thorough 
plan that they have developed. So it was good to have them there. It was one of the first times I think that OPWDD came and spent uh, that amount of time at the conference. So that was really good to see as well. Everyone's recognizing the importance of integration. So just wanted to keep you posted on some of those uh, broader issues. And if you have any questions, I may or may not be able to answer them because they're all very technical <laughs> at a high level, but I'll do my best. Okay, looks like no questions. Thank you so much. Um, we have a guest joining us today, Mr. Richard Shaw, who is the coordinator of dual recovery services and single point entry for Tompkins County Mental Health Services. Um, we had actually requested that Mr. Shaw join us to talk a little bit about how the dual diagnosis programs. Um, we have had um, guests at meetings over the last couple of months and the issue of um, individuals with substance use struggling to avail themselves of mental health services while also struggling with managing substance use issues has come up. And so we are pleased that you were able to join us today. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, we were hoping you could give us a little update on how it looks in our county for individuals with dual diagnosis and the kinds of services um, that uh, are available and uh, how people are able to access those. Yeah, I thought I would uh, have a little PowerPoint if I can share that. I wanted to give a little background on what my position is. It's kind of an unusual position and um, not everybody's really well aware of what I do. So I thought I'd uh, share that and, and take any questions. Thank you, that sounds great. So let me see if I can bring it up, here we go. And just let me know, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. All right. So um, my position is called coordinator of dual recovery services. And as I said to a, a, a judge once was, was very unhappy with me. And he said, tell me what dual recovery services were, are, what are you, what are, what are you a coordinator of? And I explained to him, there isn't this thing called dual recovery services. It's a network of different agencies with different regulatory oversight and different philosophies, slightly different philosophies, or in some cases, very different philosophies. So it's not, uh, it's not one thing. So he said, because I, because he was angry with me, so you're the coordinator of nothing. And I said, well, that's one way of looking at it. I said, it's not a thing. It's a group of things. Uh, and that's part of the issue with coordinating it, uh, it, it's not a thing. It's, a, it's a, a, a patchwork of different agencies and different services throughout the community. Uh, why do we have this position? Uh, this is a, a, a slide I put in here. You, you'll see very similar ones to this. This has, to, uh, with different populations, this one really refers to people with serious mental illness and substance use disorders. Uh, most states have their own definition of what serious mental illness is. New York has its own state, I mean, its own definition for, the, uh, for that, for what serious mental illness is in this state. Uh, but for people with serious mental illness and substance use disorders, as you notice here, are some of the highlights of this um, graph is that 49, almost 50% of people who have a co-occurring serious mental illness and substance use disorder are in a mental health services only type of a situation. So they're in a mental health treatment program, which isn't necessarily addressing their substance use uh, disorder. And as you see here, 36% of people with co-occurring serious mental illness and substance use disorders get no treatment at all. Uh, a small portion, 11.8% are people who do get what really is the goal, I think, in our county and the state and the, the country is really to provide good treatment for co-occurring mental health and substance use dis excuse me, disorders. Uh, so this position was created almost 20 years ago. We talk, about, talk a lot about uh, people not working together, agencies not working together, a lot of things that don't work well together. 
Uh, but this uh, OMH and OASIS 20, almost 20 years ago came together and said, we have two systems of care, um, mental health system of care and substance use disorder uh, system of care. And many people have co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. So we want to make sure that they get adequate care uh, and that they don't fall between the, the cracks, so to speak, between these two systems. So they created, over the course of time, there are three, uh, three rounds of um, funding for them. And I think we were, uh, Tompkins County was in the second round. We put in a, um, you know, there was a request uh, for proposals and we proposed what that position would, would be like in our county. And we were granted the position with the second round of funding. So there's 12 positions in the state of New York. Some, most of us only cover one county, which is good. We can focus really intently on the county that we're in. And there are two uh, positions that cover more than one county. So there's 12 positions, but there's a coverage of 15 counties overall. Uh, six of the positions are overseen by OMH and six are overseen by OASIS. They're the same positions, but OASIS and OMH um, kind of share the workload. Uh, so six of us report to the Office of Mental Health and six of us report to the Office of Addiction Services and Supports. And we are, we are expected to uh, report quarterly on how it's going. And prior to COVID, we were asked to come in person to Albany. So all 12 of us would go up to Albany on a quarterly basis. And we would alternate between o the offices of OMH and OASIS as to where we met. Uh, and the people who oversee us uh, at those state offices really like the position and are, are our best uh, proponents. Uh, they love the meetings. They love to hear what we're doing. We all do things differently. Uh, one of the great things about the position is that it uh, it allows for a lot of creativity. They don't. It's definitely not micromanaged. We're just told to go and do what you see fit in your county. Every county is different. And so the needs uh, vary from county to county. And there's a varying levels of buy-in. So uh, we all have our challenges in our counties. And when we get together, we kind of share our successes and uh, barriers to, to doing what we're hired to do. So I put this map together a couple of years ago, I think when I presented to the mental health department, just to give people a sense of this is that uh, in blue are the OMH dual recovery coordinators. So we're pretty spread out. Uh, the closest ones are in Oneida uh, and Orleans, Genesee and Wyoming. That's uh, one person covers those three counties uh, and one, one person covers Oneida. Closest to me in this position are people under Oasis uh, in Onondaga and Broome counties. Just something to know that we all work together. So if Onondaga or Broome needs something, I will go help them and I'll explain maybe some of the things I've done recently. Uh, so while I serve Tompkins County, if there's some need that I can serve regionally, I will go and do that. Um, like, like I say, mostly on, I help on Dogger and Broom, but I have gone as far as Fulton County to help out. Uh, so what the, the purpose of the job as coordinator of dual recovery services is to, to promote principles of integrated care. There's 12 of them. I just picked four out um, to give you some examples, but really part of my job is to really promote these principles. For example, that co-occurring conditions are an expectation not an exception. Sometimes in agencies that are providing treatment, uh, people with co-occurring disorders are looked at as a minority or outliers when in fact, uh, probably uh, in any given treatment facility, 50% or more of people have co-occurring conditions of mental illness and substance use disorders. Sometimes they're not identified. Um, and so they, it goes unaddressed, uh, the co-occurring disorder. Uh, so, one of the things that we really promote is that expect people to come to your door, through your doors <clears throat> with a co-occurring disorder and be prepared to welcome them and provide them with treatment. Um, there, there needs to be a certain mindset. The second principle I have uh, listed here that it's a recovery partnership when we're working with people with co-occurring disorders and there's there really needs to be an empathic, hopeful, strength-based approach. Um, that may seem like it goes without saying, but a lot of people with co-occurring disorders 
are doubles, doubly stigmatized. Um, and sometimes it's harder for them to find where they best fit with uh, a, an appropriate treatment provider. So some people, um, you know, if they end up in a, if they go to a mental health treatment program and there's a focus on the substance use, it's not unusual for somebody to be uh, recommended to either go also to a substance use treatment program or to go to a substance use treatment program instead. And I can talk about that more. And that really creates a problem for the person trying to get help where they now have to, in a sense, be their own care manager. Um, this that third point I have there is a bone of contention. Each condition is considered to be primary. That's not how treatment programs work. They say oh, we're, we're, our primary focus is on mental illness and another program is saying our primary focus is on substance use disorders. But philosophy wise, um, we really want to say one isn't primary over the other. We're looking at how the two things work together. Uh, we're looking at the person as a whole. And the, the whole idea of dual recovery, I hope that at some point that, that term fades away where we're not talking about people in terms of dual and co-occurring, but just as people, as a, an integrated whole. Uh, there isn't one correct program. So in other words, it, in order to really successfully help a lot of people with co-occurring disorders, there needs to be a lot of creativity. And some people don't neatly fit into treatment programs as they exist now. And I can give dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of that. So it's an everyday occurrence where somebody isn't the best fit for a particular program. And the program, hopefully, and with my help, uh, can be flexible and creative and make room for the person and, and help the person. What the state says that the coordinators should do is these, they want us to report on these four four areas. And I can give you some examples of that um, as we go along here. But so I, I do, do a lot of trainings. Um, I work at helping people get, get accessibility to services. So there, it wouldn't be, it's not unusual for somebody to call me and say, we have somebody at the shelter, seems to have a mental illness. Um, we don't know what to do with the person. Where do we start? And I will give them a roadmap, uh, meet with the person if the person's willing to meet and kind of get the ball rolling as to where, where to start with getting the person treatment or housing or any number of other services. Um, looking at collaboration and integration of care is, is one of the main things I focus on. So for example, when people are, I work with treatment courts, helping treatment courts to have mental health and substance use treatment providers work together and provide integrated treatment, not parallel treatment. Uh, sometimes treatment programs are working with the same person and they're not, there's no meeting of the minds. So I sometimes refer to that as they're operating in parallel uh, or in silos and they're not really connecting. So part of the coordination is getting people together and having a conversation of how we provide treatment better so that everybody is ta talking to one another and we have an integrated uh, treatment plan, for example. One of the things I'm doing with the Family Treatment Court is helping them to get all the providers together, including DSS, and having one vision as to what we're doing to try to try to help the individual in the treatment court. And that hasn't, we have many meetings together, but there's not truly true integration yet. So uh, I've been asked if I would lead a, a meeting where we really just look at somebody's multiple treatment plans, and put them together and talk about how we all, all are working together uh, at different with different parts of the plan towards an integrated whole. And I, as I often do, just say yes, I'll do that because I'm that's that's what I do. And it's exciting to see to have a, a, a an agent a entity like the Family Treatment Court ask for help. Um, some of the cross training I do of professionals. These are all things that I've been uh, trained as a trainer in. COVID cut down on the amount of trainings I do and cut a few of these short uh, to ones that I do a lot of training, both in this county and in the region are mental health first aid, uh, motivational interviewing. I've done uh, years of motivational interview interviewing training. Uh, in the case of some agencies, I've done training over the course of more than 10 years with them to help develop staff. 
Um, things like crisis intervention or de-escalation. At one point I was asked to do de-escalation trainings for the entire county staff and I and a probation officer and a sheriff's deputy did that. And I also have a specialization in tobacco cessation. That term isn't the greatest term in the world, but for practical purposes, I'll use that, but addressing tobacco use uh, among people who are coming to mental health and substance use treatment is something that I've been very involved in for a long time. And at one time, my full-time job was called tobacco cessation specialist uh, when I worked down in Philadelphia. And so I have a lot of experience with that. Um, so along the lines of approved accessibility to services, um, I put in just some of the roles I have in this county and I'm a single point of entry coordinator, which means I help people who qualify for special housing under the Office of Mental Health health to get housed. And when I first started uh, sitting in on that committee before I started to run it, I saw that people with substance use disorders weren't always, were sometimes screened out uh, where they were, they were considered disqualified in a sense because they, their so-called primary issue was substance use and was able to, when I took over that position to just say, we have to stop doing this. We have to stop uh, saying that somebody's uh, substance use issues kind of overshadow their mental illness and therefore they don't qualify. So now I think probably for the past almost 10 years that that kind of discrimination has been non-existent. I'm also in the county for now anyway, uh, the assisted outpatient treatment coordinator. So most everybody in, who's uh, out, assisted outpatient treatment is really a court order where somebody is ordered brought to court and if the judge uh, uh, rules in the favor of the order, signs an order for somebody to have to get outpatient treatment. Nearly everybody who's um, under an assisted outpatient treatment order has a co-occurring substance use disorder. So part of what I do is really try to help treatment providers, uh, particularly the ACT team, the assertive community treatment team to address the needs of people with co-occurring disorder disorders. Um, I advocate for anybody with co-occurring disorder in the county. Um, it's not unusual for somebody um, to call me up to ask me to intervene in some way and I make a connection with the person. And I've worked with some people over the course of years who really didn't want to come into a formal treatment program, but were willing to talk to me and have had varying levels of success of helping people eventually get into treat treatment. Uh, I have an ombudsman role. That was something that was very big for uh, with the for, uh, the commissioner I was hired under, uh, Robert DeLuca, um, to really intervene when there are uh, issues that get a little heated or uh, there's conflict. I've been involved in many situations where somebody is being discharged from treatment or housing, and I have been asked to come in, or sometimes I just sort of invite myself in to get involved. Um, and to try to help the person um, negotiate with the treatment provider, housing provider, to not be discharged from the program. I deal with those at least on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. I was just dealing with one today where somebody's being evicted, and I'm trying to, to help prevent that. Uh, just some of the things I've done recently is mental health first aid training for the Tompkins County Sheriff De the Sheriff's Department. They uh, I think the under sheriff emailed Frank and said, can we, can you do mental health first aid training for the sheriff's department? I said, yes, I'll come do it. And uh, we did, uh, I called one of my co-trainers down in Binghamton and he, he, he's a, a, a sergeant in the Binghamton police department. And we did a week, uh, we did uh, five trainings in a row and trained all of the, the people in the sheriff's department who didn't have specialized uh, crisis intervention training. Uh, Cayuga Addiction Recovery Services, their residential program, asked me to do some consultation with them, so I'm working with them. Like I mentioned, I'm assisting the Family Treatment Court in doing integrated treatment planning. Uh, family Treatment Court is very well established. It's very large, and getting, getting everybody together to work together is challenging, but uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We haven't quite gotten it up off of the ground yet, but we're getting there. I've been involved in that, involved in that court for as long as I've been uh, in this position, which is uh, about 13 years now. 
Uh, and something I'm just doing recently is helping the County Mental Health Clinic develop programming for people with co-occurring disorders. So how do you develop group programming um, that meets the needs for people who are coming in with substance use uh, disorders? Really, the ultimate goal is to work towards the establishment of an integrated system of care. I'll send you some of the um, documents that I'm referencing. Uh, New York State has really strongly uh, drawn from the work of Dr. Ken Minkoff. He's the one who came up with the principles that I referred to earlier. He developed a model called the Comprehensive Continuous Integrated System of Care, which is a mouthful, but it's really about having all of the systems work together. So, you know, just an example, the law enforcement, the hospital, the behavioral unit, outpatient treatment programs, care managers, having everybody to work together to see the person as a whole and to look at things in an integrated way. Does the person, what are the person's legal needs, medical needs, substance use needs, mental health needs? Um, and it's not some pie in the sky idea. There are uh, places that have really, really developed a very strong uh, system of uh, integrated system of care uh, that works and is very strong. And I thought I would end there and see if people have any questions. I hope I didn't talk too fast. Yes, Sheila. Uh, yes, um, when you showed us that pie chart and the, the percentage of people that are untreated, does that include the prison population? That's a good question. I would assume yes, but that's a good question. I will look into that. Some prisons and jails do offer treatment. Um, I went to a, to a conference a few years ago and the, the administrator of the Cook County Jail um, built a treatment program within, a, an, outpatient, an outpatient treatment program within his jail. It was pretty remarkable what he did. So I don't wanna say all prisons or jails don't provide treatment, but I would imagine that there are many people who are incarcerated are not getting treatment are probably part of that number. Um, I had a question about what it currently looks like locally if someone, for example, um, has a substance use, use issue and also struggles with depression. Um, how available are services? How much of a wait is there? Do people have a difficult time getting into uh, this kind of care? Is there, like, what does it really look like on the ground for an individual who's seeking treatment? Yeah, it, it varies. Some uh, wait, waiting lists, wait times can really vary quite a bit depending on what's happening in agencies. Uh, I think all agencies here, you know, some of the real positives, all of the Outpatient treatment programs work really hard to get people in as soon as possible. And I'm always working with the uh, intake team here to see how quickly we can get people in. For example, the, the homeless shelter, St. John's will call me. They just did recently and said, how fast can we get people in? And so I will call the intake team and gauge you know, where things stand. How quickly can we get people in? We do offer uh, the mental health department open access where people can walk in and be seen. Um, so people, you know, back to the kind of what we're trying to develop here is that the, the outpatient substance use treatment providers and the mental health treatment providers do take people in and they assess for both issues. So substance use treatment providers, for example, will screen and assess for mental health and they will either to the degree that they can address it within their services or they will refer people to a mental health treatment provider. And then ideally the two providers work together. So people have access to services, uh, waiting times take a while. It varies so much that I like, I couldn't put a time on it. If somebody walked into the mental health department right now, my understanding is they could be seen uh, they would be uh, asked about, uh, they would be priority, you know, there are people that would need to be prioritized. So there's a prioritization um, uh, protocol, but uh, people can walk in and be seen. And all OASIS and uh, OMH treatment programs are expected to and do 
address both issues. When I first came here 20 years ago to the Ithaca area, I worked for the Alcohol and Drug Council. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons they wanted to hire me for their uh, program is because uh, uh, to run what uh, was a co-occurring uh, group at that time. And actually there was a person from the mental health department who through some type of grant did the, did the group with me. So even back then, 20 years ago, there was cooperation between uh, substance use and mental health treatment providers. And what is the vision for where this is going and how, like what, how, what are kind of like the, the areas for growth, if you will, what, what is our, what, what does our community need to do better? Yeah, uh, some of the areas of growth are for us to work together better. So some people are in multiple treatment programs, for example, um, and those, we don't really have a, in my opinion, an efficient system to communicate back and forth. Uh, so I'm working with an intern from Binghamton University, and he's seeing a client, and the client's also in the Alcohol and Drug Council, also being seen by the Alcohol, Alcohol and Drug Council. This person's in a mental health treatment court. And so part of what I did is got everybody together to talk about the person and to, to work together for the person. That hadn't been happening. So for months, we'd all been working in these kind of parallel, along these parallel lanes, you know, it's just saying stay in your lane. In this case, you don't want to stay in your lane. You want to crisscross and intersect and work together. So better coordination between programs. There's this term. It's not used as much these days called siloing, where people are in their own silos. Uh, and I think that still exists. So somebody could be in two treatment programs and both programs not really understand what the goals are. There may be overlapping goals. There may be some redundancy in what treatment is provided. There may be two different, uh, slightly different maybe philosophies of how treatment is done. And in those cases, um, as some people put it, and I, I kind of borrow this idea, uh, it, it puts the person in the position of being the coordinator for his or her own, her own care. And that I really, the ideal is for uh, treatment programs to be coordinating so that it takes that burden off of the person getting the treatment. Person shouldn't have to be is her own care manager. Uh, we should be, and I have never heard of anybody, any person receiving services who objected to uh, multiple treatment programs working together and, and uh, people uh, communicating and cooperating so, to, so as to streamline care for the person. I used to do a group weekly where I met with treatment providers and we had a, um, uh, uh, a release of information that covered all of the all of those of us who met together and every person who I ever asked, would you mind if, would you sign a release of information so we can all talk, talk together? Uh, and most everybody said, uh, please do. Everybody said, yes. Many people said, please do. Please talk together. Uh, so I'll give you, you know, one real practical purpose of that is so that somebody doesn't have an overwhelming schedule of treatment appointments Sometimes somebody's expect, given a recommendation to do X amount of groups at the Alcohol and Drug Council and is given a recommendation for uh, a number of treatment sessions at the mental health department. And without coordination, that person might really get overwhelmed quickly. And that happens in treatment courts a lot where people have so much stuff that they're expected to do. It gets, can be very overwhelming. How do individuals um, kind of access this coordinated care. So um, how does a person know that this is available and this should be happening? That really comes down to, you know, I'm happy, to, uh, one of the groups I work with uh, a lot here is uh, NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We have a very strong chapter here in Tompkins County. And one of the things I did with them, and this is this, this speaks to how this job works is I think well, the first month or two I was in this job, I was asked to go speak to NAMI. And they said, we don't know what to do, like how to, who to talk to at the mental health department when we have loved ones there, where to start, what, what you do there. And uh, what I said is, well, until I figure out who you should call, just call me. Um, and out of that, and that still is the case today that they, I'm a prime point person for NAMI. So if a, fan, a loved one calls and says, we have this situation going on, they'll refer the person to me. 
to, to kind of navigate the system. This is what the system is. This is, these are some things that might help you in this situation. For example, a, a loved one who, uh, some, a fam, family or other loved ones who have somebody in the community who has untreated mental illness or substance use issues. Uh, NAMI will refer the person to me and I'll start to help them navigate the system. So every treatment program is aware of me. The, the degree to which they make it known and refer people to me varies quite a bit. But um, so the word is out there and I take every opportunity I can to let people know what I do and encourage people to, um, to contact me. I'm known probably more in this county as a single point of entry coordinator than I am as the dual recovery coordinator. So a lot of agencies and people know me through that. I get calls, multiple calls every day about that. And many of the people who I'm serving through the single point of entry do have co-occurring mental health and substance use issues. So it's really, uh, I expect agencies uh, to really get spread the word and to refer people to me. Uh, including, you know, St. John's, the homeless shelter, uh, CMC, you know, all the agencies that are involved in this patchwork of uh, integrated coordinated care um, can steer somebody my way or call just for some consultation. Um, Cayuga Medical Associates just called me. Uh, we had a meeting last week, just what do you do and uh, how can you help us? And uh, we had a, a real long, a real good long talk. And so I'm always part of the job is really always networking and, and having people understand what I do and encouraging them to make use of me. Thank you. Maria, if I could follow up on some of, some of that a little bit too. I, first, I want to give Rich all kinds of credit. Um, he's been working for us for quite some time, and it's not Rich's responsibility to integrate care in our community, um, but he's done an amazing job of, of really helping move that needle for us. Um, the system wasn't designed that way. I think Rich alluded to it at the beginning, um, even from a billing perspective, right? For a mental health clinic, your primary diagnosis has to be a mental health diagnosis. And for a substance use clinic, um, your primary diagnosis has to be a substance use. So the same person could have two different primary diagnoses depending on where they're seeking care, just in order for billing to occur. So that fundamentally creates a challenge, right, in this uh, integrated kind of thinking of things. Um, and, and I'll be honest, when I came to mental health, what, seven years ago, um, and, you know, I had some initial conversations with Rich about his role, it struck me as odd that it was even necessary, right? Because to the layperson, it seems like, of course, if someone has a substance use disorder, there's probably underlying mental health issues and vice versa. Um, that need to be addressed, but the system wasn't designed that way. Um, our, our staffs weren't trained that way. Um, clinicians coming out of school didn't have, either they'd been in the field or the, their, the, the system wasn't you know, educating them and training them in a way that they'd be prepared to address uh, dual diagnosis um, you know, within patients. And so this is a systemic issue uh, that I think We've made some inroads. I think you heard a couple months ago from our OASIS providers that um, I think they've accepted the, the, this at their heart and Rich, I think he alluded to it as well, that many of them will try their best to address the, you know, the uh, mental health issues or make a referral um, for those folks. And I think our clinic is the same way as well as the other mental health clinics in town. We're not perfect. Um, I, we, we're way far from perfect, but I think we've made improvement, you know, to the point where I don't think anyone's being turned away. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I can honestly say when I first got involved um, with the mental health department, um, people were being turned away from our clinic and other providers in the community because the mental health provider felt like their, their substance use disorder needed to be addressed first before they could get to the mental health and vice versa. <laughs> Right. And so that really put people in a bad spot because they showed up wanting help. And the person they showed up to said, you know, you need to go talk to this other person first. I think we've I think that has come out of our organizations um, in the community, the provider organizations. Um, so at least from that perspective, folks wouldn't hit that barrier. But um, I, I'm, I, I am confident that there are still individuals that, as Rich described, their care is not managed 
between multiple providers. Um, and there, there's challenges to that. Rich does that for some people, but his program isn't, he, he's really not supposed to be the person that does that. He's supposed to help us build systems, but because there's these acute needs and Rich is so good at it, he's, you know, he's really stepped up and filled that role for people, um, you know, uh, over with, at, during his time with us. And, and we're so happy that he does that. Um, but we need systemic change in order to really see the impact of this. And, and to the point about care management, um, I, I think all of our clinicians would love to be able to have a meeting with the provider at the substance use disorder clinic and vice versa about shared clients. The challenge with that is where is the time, right? Where is the resource to be able to do that? Because in order to you know, meet our financial needs, we have to be seeing people, you know, very consistently. And you all have been through these conversations with us and all of our providers are this way, whether it's mental health or substance use, there's a financial reality to the organization. And so um, the structure of payment isn't built to provide opportunity for that coordination to happen. So we end up patching things together, you know, as Rich described it. And, and you know, he's been that patch uh, for a lot of people, um, particularly around housing um, uh, over the years. So um, I, I wanna credit Rich for everything that he's done and his willingness to pretty much take on anything we've asked him, you know, during his time with us and do it all very, very well. Um, and then also say that it's not, his responsibility necessarily alone to change the system or ensure that every client has this integrated level of care. And we as a system, and I that say that collectively, the mental health department, our other mental health providers and substance use providers and developmental disability providers, um, there's gotta be a better way to have the care coordinated. And so far we haven't found a mechanism um, that is, is supported financially. Yeah, to be able to do that as successfully as we would like. So just in short, Rich does amazing work for us. We appreciate what he does. Um, there's systemic problems that we're continuing to work at um, and we know we're not perfect. And there's more, there's more that can be done for those that have dual diagnosis in our community. Yeah, you really address kind of a piece that, because it, it, it shouldn't be one person's job. It needs to be a systemic, the system needs to be structured in a way that this function is somehow fulfilled. And I guess my question is, are there uh, discussions about this or thoughts about this? Or do we have a vision about moving in this direction? Or is this not something that right now is on the table? Well, go ahead, Rich. Well, yeah, I think, well, I think we're move, moving toward it. We keep making progress toward it. Um, considering like what Frank said is that these are systemic issues. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, when he went up, I did, when he went, we, we would go to Albany would, would say over and over again, stop creating the problems that you want us to fix. And I got what he's saying. I didn't quite put it that way, but uh, he's basically say, saying these are systemic problems and you're having us kind of put our finger in the holes in the dam uh, and you need to really just fix the dam. So, but I, I, I would say considering that, I mean, one of the things I found is people are just work, will work so hard uh, to, to make this system work the best way it can. Uh, one of the things I wanna mention is sometimes there are some people in the community who's, who really uh, call for us to be very creative and work together very well. And there isn't a perfect treatment set up to help them and, People are certainly willing to get together and be as creative as they can be to make something work. I think we could do better in that realm. I think we, we could get more creative and develop better system, a better existing system. But it's not, it's not for lack of uh, you know, people being willing to do it. I've been to meetings for one person where there's over 20 people in the meeting, um, including that person. We, who was sometimes overwhelmed. Uh, we had a meeting at the hospital once, somebody who was in, in out of their ER a lot and had multiple issues, substance use, mental illness, um, and just one call to the hospital, can we get together and talk about how we can help this person? And next thing I knew, I was up in the hospital with over 20 people there and they were there because they really wanted to help him. Uh, and, to, and that was going to take really trying to 
look creatively about how they can change some things and better accommodate him. So the extent that people go to try to help individuals is always really inspiring. It's frustrating to see some of the ways uh, we fall short, but it's it's always inspiring to see there's no lack, no lack of enthusiasm in this county to try to help people. Yeah, and, and I would just add that I, I think we have made some progress. I think there's some irony in the fact that, you know, the state has created a dual recovery coordinator position when, quite frankly, they are responsible for creating this bifurcated system. Um, and so it, there, there's that component of it too. But I, I don't want to blame the state for this because it's not them. It is the, the, the system and, and how we've, we've, we've developed it over the years. And to your point, Maria, about are we working on this? I would say generally, yes, we're working on it. There are, are high risk people, as Rich was describing, I think are getting attention, whether it's family treatment court, mental health court. Susan Spicer goes up to the hospital, you know, our clinic director to meet with folks. Rich is meeting with, you know, uh, our, our, our OASIS providers as well. So I think that's happening. But right now, quite honestly, our focus has been fortifying each of those systems, the, the continuum of care in each of those systems, right? On the substance use side of things, where we've got uh, alcohol and drug council, you know, building the detox center and open access, which hopefully, you know, turns into that 24 center for 24 seven center for somebody with substance use disorder that can get into treatment immediately whenever they decide to, and then have that coordinated through all of the different providers of OASIS services, whether it's residential at CARS, outpatient at CARS, outpatient at ADC, outpatient at REACH, um, trying to coordinate care within those systems. And same with mental health, right? We're trying to make sure that we're transitioning people um, effectively out into primary care that can so that we have capacity for, for other folks. So there's a lot of work going on about fortifying the existing types of care um, and I think once those are, are built, um, there'll be a better, an even better opportunity for us to then, okay, we've got the continuum of care that we wanted on both sides of this. How do we bring those two things together? Um, we're also looking at, there's, a, there's some grants that the state has put out um, that are looking to try to address um, particularly crisis stabilization uh, around some of these dual diagnosed uh, individuals and, and having early access to all of the, the different services. And we're looking into those with community partners. So um, yes, I think there is work um, towards, um, towards trying to achieve what we all would hope to see. Um, but I, I don't want anyone to, I, I don't want to give any false hope that somehow we're going to fix this in the next six months or, you know, there's going to be a place where immediately anyone who has any problem can show up and they'll get directed to the right place and they'll have access to all the appropriate services and with no problems. Um, I, that is the ideal and certainly the dream, but there's a huge amount of work that, that will need to happen before we can, we can achieve. Yeah, these, these systems took decades we're decades in the making and, you know, I think we're moving it. You know, they want it, the, the bottom line was good quality care for people with mental illness, good quality care for people with substance use disorders, but they went, they grew along parallel lines. And so now it's, and, and that's the good news that, that such treatment is available uh, for people for those issues. It's very, very re readily available. Problem is that these, these parallel lines were developed that just need to now be inter connected. So it's kind of a historical issue of just how this developed. I think, you know, Oasis and OMH, you know, are, are, are their own um, separate individualized entities. Uh, and they've talked about merging, but I think it's, it's not going to happen anytime soon. There's a lot of things that need to be worked out. In an ideal world, a, a lot more things would be integrated, but it's just not easier said. It's easier said than done. Well, it's very encouraging because it sounds like people are thinking in all the right directions. And obviously, you know, you don't, you don't turn the boat in. <laughs> it takes a while to turn a boat that's been sailing this long, this big a boat. Um, but it's very encouraging to hear that there's so many people working on this and thinking about this and moving in these directions. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jan. Question. It might be more for Frank, and it might be something that's already been answered, and I just can't remember. And I'm sorry if I'm making people repeat it, but um, the 
opioid settlement money that's coming into Tompkins County, how is that being used? Uh, there haven't been any decisions made on that yet. So the legislature ultimately will make the determination. And um, we had some very preliminary conversations with county administration, uh, but they wanted to get some direction from the legislature before we went too far down the path on how those were, would be spent, because some of them are restricted to um, treatment and the, the response to opioids, and some of the dollars are not. And so we wanted to know what the legislature's appetite was on how they wanted those dollars aligned before we went too far down the road planning with them. So we're, we're waiting for some direction from the legislature. It seems like it's a lot of money and that maybe there'd be an opportunity there to do something, try something different or some, be a little creative. I'm not suggesting anything in particular. I'm just hoping that maybe that's the case because we are so embedded in these systems that are so hard to change, but maybe there's something really different or new that you know has the opportunity to be tried with a small amount of that money. Yeah, so just so you know, the, do the dollar value, I, I think the recurring amount is $180,000. Um, so it's an annual recurring amount for like 18 years or something like that. And then I think there is a one-time allocation of about $200,000 roughly. Don't quote me on those. It's in that ballpark. Um, so it, it, it's money. It's not uh, system changing money. Um, you know, when, when it's all put together, the settlement sounds giant when you distribute it out to, you know, all the different entities that are getting it. Um, it is, you know, it's, it, it's a bit smaller, um, but no, I, I agree with you, Jan, that, that is our hope, um, that will, you know, once we get direction from the legislature on, on how much of it will be, you know, allocated to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, I'm using treatment very loosely. It can be really anything related to, you know, opioid support. Um, then, you know, we'll work with community partners on trying to figure out, you know, what would be the best use of those dollars. There are also going to be some more dollars coming out of Oasis. Can you guys hear me? You're a little quiet, but we can hear you. Can hear me? Okay. There's also going to be some funding coming out of Oasis as well. Uh, so I'd be interested to see how they tell us to use those dollars. They're probably going to have. Uh, okay, you can hear me. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> Veronica. Thanks. Um, just because Frank was mentioning direction from the legislature, um, I might not be up to speed, but the last I heard, we were waiting for our own direction from the state via um, via county administration for like what exactly these restrictions are and is the unrestricted funds really unrestricted. Um, I'll try to get updated on that. But in the meantime, since we haven't really talked about what to use the funds for yet, if y'all have ideas, thoughts as a board or as individuals, um, I'd certainly love to hear them. I think the whole uh, Health and Human Services Committee at least would as well. So you can email me, call me, whatever. Yeah, and, that invitation out there. And Veronica and the board, I think the plan, um, at least the, the last that it was left with me from county administration was that, you know, once we got that the direction on, you know, the amount that would be available to us, that, you know, they would be looking to us, the collective us, our, our you know, the, the boards, the subcommittees, the um, uh, our providers in the community to, you know, come up with suggestions and recommendations on how best to, to use the dollars. So we'll, once we have that go ahead, we'll, we as a department will also be helping to facilitate those conversations um, and uh, get input on how we might best use it. Yes, do. Well, I had two things. One was how much money was involved. That was answered, $180,000. Uh, I guess a, a quick response is uh, fentanyl-laced drugs is what's part of the major part of the epidemic. Um, just a quick brainstorm piece for legislation would be to hire a couple of therapists, counselors to be able to deal particularly 
on that issue. Education identification is just, as we've talked about in the past, just not a lot of that out there. Um, and also I wanted to piggyback on the, the support uh, for, for Rich. I've known him ever since he's had this position. And uh, you know, I, he used to participate a lot in the substance use uh, subcommittee. And um, I always thought it was a, a tough job for him or anybody to, to do because the mindset of our society has been if you have an alcohol problem, you go to an alcohol place. If you have a drug problem, you go to a drug place. If you have a mental health problem, you go to a mental health place. And, uh, you know, Rich is trying to, as a dual coordinator, change uh, the way business is conducted in New York State. Um, and as he said, uh, Oasis and OMH is. Um, a little behind in its uh, progressiveness to, to unite that. But, um, you know, in the last 13 years, I've seen him, you know, fight the single war, so to speak, um, very appropriately. And, you know, I give him all the kudos in the world to be able to continue to do that. I, I, I suspect part of uh, bringing Rich in uh, tonight uh, had to do with uh, some of the questions that we had uh, other people had about, well, what happens to somebody who um, has a dual diagnosis? Is that a, a, is that a real thing? <laughs> uh, how does that person get the help they need? And as Rich and, and Frank said, that's, it's not Rich's job to, to try and seek that out, but to adjust the, uh, the, the kind of attitude of our local providers so that that's a more uh, fluent action. You don't just look at somebody as, well, you had an alcohol problem, so we're going to traditionally send you to the alcohol council. Drug problems used to go to uh, cars and mental health. You know, we send you to the mental health clinic. That's all combined now. It should be combined. And um, thanks, Rich, for moving it in the right direction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Any other thoughts or questions or? No, well, we really appreciate you joining us and sharing that information and facilitating, I think, a really productive discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, next on our agenda, we have um, bylaw and charter discussions. And as we talked about, the bylaws committee has not had the opportunity to meet and um, uh, act or think about the um, the ideas that were brought up last time. This was something that came up at the uh, general, the meeting of the broader, the whole board. Um, I do want to reiterate, as Frank said, that we'll need to have something ready to send. Uh, we'll need to have something ready to send to the legislature in September. So we are on a little bit of a um, the, the clock is ticking, um, but I think we're on it. So we're in, we're in good shape and we'll probably we'll spend, I think, a, a fair amount of time at our next meeting talking about bylaws and making sure that we feel like we're on the same page and we have something we're comfortable with submitting. Um, was there anything else that anyone wanted to, to add about that? Um, I had mentioned, oh, and then Frank, merger updates, we got that. Thank you, check that off our list. Um, I had um, mentioned that um, thinking about mission um, would be, I think as well, a valuable uh, exercise perhaps. I don't know how people feel about that. Um, if anybody has any initial ideas or thoughts that they wanted to sort of put out there. Um, and potentially bring that as something that we could talk about when we talk about our bylaws as well, about the mission of our board and yes, Jan. I should know this, but what's our current mission statement? You know, I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know what our current mission statement is off the top of my head. Um, I see who comes up with it first. <laughs>
Well, I guess we can move on if nobody knows. I mean, I, I just, I just wonder. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something I would like to propose as, as a something we think about uh, and talk about a little more perhaps at a future meeting. Um, okay, are there any other questions or ideas or thoughts or anything else that people would like to present to the board before we adjourn? No, okay, can I have a motion? There's the to... purpose. What's that? I'm sorry, I just noticed that in the chat there was uh, someone put in the purpose. Was that uh, you, Frank? Yeah, yeah. It's, yes. It's out of the bylaw. Oh, thank you, thanks. I'll read that. The Tompkins County Mental Health Board is responsible for developing the community preventive, rehabilitative, and treatment services offering continuity of care for improving and expanding existing community programs for individuals with mental illness, developmental disabilities, and for those experience or recovering from substance abuse or substance dependence, for planning the integration of community and state services and facilities for the mentally disabled, and for cooperating with other local governments and with the state in the provision of joint services and sharing of resources. Thank you for adding that. So you said you wanted to talk to that, talk about the, our mission in a future meeting, right? I think I, it's something we uh, that you know certainly if the board feels like it's a valuable thing to address. Um, my my thought here is that purpose and mission are a little bit different. Um, purpose is why we exist, and mission is more. Um, uh, kind of how we as a board fulfill this purpose um, and uh, how we as a group, um, you know, what, what perhaps we, we feel that this is being met and, you know, that this purpose is being fully served and we feel like we are doing exactly this. Um, and maybe there are things that my sense has been that there have been some um, thoughts raised at previous meetings that perhaps uh, we are not fully aligned with the purposes stated in this particular statement. And ways to think about that, ways to improve that if that's something that needs to be improved. Um, so just something I propose as, as a something to, to consider. Yes, Paula. So um, just reading over the purpose and the discussion that we just uh, had, I think it would be good to change our purpose so it reflects, uh, you know, the integration of treatment for people with co-occurring disorders, because the way that we have the purpose stated, it sounds like each one is completely separate. Thank you. Elise? I think that um, it would be nice to set aside a, a good amount of time to have this conversation because I think that maybe what we need to talk about is how we are um, operationalizing the purpose and try to um, connect this purpose to actual activities and actions. Does that sound, but thoughts? I Some... think that makes sense. Okay. To me, I mean, you can ask other people too. Um, I think you said um, much more clearly what it was I was sort of trying to take a stab at. <laughs> so thank you for that. Okay. Yep, cool. I agree. We should have some more board discussion on that at our next meeting. Great. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Stu, thank you very much. And a second. Um, Travis, thank you very much. Um, we have the motion to adjourn the meeting has, oh wait, we need to approve it. All in favor? Yes. Excellent. Meeting has been adjourned. Thank you so much. Yeah.